Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Miguel Amado. I'm the director of Series Art Center. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here with you and Marie, Joanne, and everyone else who has uh, contributed to this exhibition. Um, so this is our first real uh, launch event uh, since COVID-19 started. And it's great to have that opportunity coinciding with uh, Marie Brett's exhibition. Marie is an artist who is based in uh, the county of Cork, who I met around COVID time, <laughs> around COVID. We never know the exact moment in the last few years. And um, uh, I came across her practice uh, when I moved to Ireland, and then I had the opportunity and the pleasure and the honor of uh, collaborating with Kat Gorman, who's sitting here today, and um, through her also to start collaborating with Marie a few years ago. And uh, so I'm going just to give you a little bit of um, housekeeping stuff. So as you know, there's a fire exit there and the main door where we came from. Hopefully it won't be necessary to use. We are filming this event and we're going to take some photographs, uh, just general audience photographs. If there is anyone who doesn't really want to appear on any photographs, then you have to come to me and Brian, my colleague there, at the end, so that we can remove any pictures where you may be featured. This is for documentation purposes, but they also may be shared on social media. We hope this uh, event, uh, the recording of it, will be made available online, so we can always review it, and also you can hopefully share it with your friends and colleagues. So, um, yeah, so this is really an important event for us because um, it represents a moment of almost the relaunch of Series Art Center uh, past what we hope is past the COVID period. And it's an opportunity also to uh, clearly identify um, ways of working and models of programming that we've been trying to develop here. So it's the first time uh, an artist based in the county of Cork or in Ireland showing across the three spaces of Series Art Center. We've had a similar exhibition a few months ago with an international artist. And also it's a very important moment for us because we were able to commission a new artwork from Marie with the support of the Arts Council, so a specific award. And that work is the work that you may be able to see next door. And then it's also an important moment where we try to contribute to um, identify uh, critical important artists developing the critical important work that we hopefully are able to help make more available to a wider audience and also to the uh, specialized audience of the visual arts. And it's really important and really fundamental that Marie was part of that process. So today, we, we have decided that we're no longer doing openings. We are people come for a drink. It's not no longer something that we want to do. But we want to turn our launch events into discursive moments where we hopefully are able to produce some knowledge or some criticality about an artist or a practice or a theme or an idea. And it's really important to then uh, also involve others, collaborators and peers in Ireland that are able to help us doing that. So it's really a pleasure and an honor to have you, Joanne. Joanne Laws as uh, our guest uh, contributor for today. She's going to be in conversation with Marie and myself. <coughs> Excuse me, Joanne is an art critic, an art writer, a researcher, and also an editor of the Visual Arts Artist News Sheet. So I also had the pleasure and opportunity and honor of working with her on, uh, on other occasions. And this was really uh, a moment of you know, encountering again. And she has been really interested in Uri's practice uh, in general. So she's really prepared a very interesting conversation, which will hopefully enable us to highlight and look at specific aspects of Uri's practice. The exhibition is quite diverse in its um, presentation. So we have a new work next door. We have this room, which is a mixed display of, of documentation and artifacts that reimagine other works by Marie, which we'll discuss later. And then we have a selection of films that Marie has produced in the past also being presented. So in our modest scale, it's an ambitious attempt to uh, survey or illuminate key elements of a, of a practice that has been evolving 
for 20, 25 years. And that has appeared in many occasions in, very, in the variety of contexts uh, in, involving many, many people, and we're trying to condense all of that here. Uh, we hope to put together a publication that will be uh, prepared across the summer, where some of the, uh, the discourse that we want to enable to that we want to generate around Marie's practice will then evolve. Just a final comment from myself at this moment. I want to thank, of course, Marie in the first place for the gen generosity uh, for contrib of a collaboration, and of course for her art uh, practice in general. Without artists, we would not be here and our desire at the core of what we do. So thank you so much, Marie, for all your uh, dedication for, to this project and to your work in general. And I also want to thank uh, our stakeholders, the Arts Council of Ireland and the Cork County Council, who is represented here by, by Maeve Mulrannan, Assistant Arts Officer, and to the Board of Sirius, uh, who has uh, enabled us to operate the way we, we believe it's um, the right way. And finally, but not the least, I want to thank everyone at Sirius who has been contributing to this project. Uh, here that we have Nico, fundamental element of our team, Megan, and Barbara outside, and uh, Brian. Without them, this exhibition would have not been possible. And we also have Willie here today, who has been a long member of Sirius until recently, who I have, and who, has, who is a key element of the community. When, who has also been in dialogue with myself and Marie around many other things, including stuff that is in this exhibition. So to all of them, thank you so much for all, all your contribution. And uh, yeah, we should just kick off. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> and thank you so much again for being here. It's really important. I was at a music event just yesterday evening and the musicians were all saying, thank you so much for coming. It's great to see you be again in live. So it's also really important that we, you know, have these moments of gathering to help us navigate the times in which uh, we are living and create a sense of, of community and of, um, of hope for the future. Thank you. So I'll end over now to Joanne. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I guess I would second that in terms of it's just lovely to see so many people in real life and not mediated on the screen. Um, it actually feels a bit like we're having some kind of really important press conference here with some of the equipment. Um, but yeah, I think it's just going to be a very informal chat with Marie about her work across the three spaces and her newly commissioned really important piece as well. Um, so I guess for anyone here who's not completely familiar with Marie's practice, I thought it might be worth just starting with a really simple question to kick off. Um, so we will obviously use the artworks as a lens through which to discuss her um, very prominent kind of making and collaborative strands of her practice. But to begin with, I thought I might just ask, um, how did you actually come to, uh, to have, you know, to train in the arts? Um, and maybe you can speak about your background a little bit and how you ended up um, deciding to work or maintain a, a practice as a full-time professional, uh, socially engaged artist. Okay. <laughs> no, yeah. that sounded a lot more complicated than it was meant to. No, Tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I'm like to so. um, yeah. Sure. So to tell you a bit, a bit, I suppose, about my background. Yeah. Um, and and to, to echo what... Um, well, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming. It's, it's really lovely to have you here, so thank you. Um, this is quite funny, we're getting back entry, which is really great. I love that. And I love having the dog over there, which is really fantastic. So thank you for putting the dog there. No, no pressure. And also, um, just to add as well, um, my voice is a little bit compromised, so I'll do my best to project, but... Um, Put your hands up at the back if you can't hear Yeah, child. slightly rusty and uh, have kind of just a lingering, raspy voice, but I'll, I'll do my best to be noisy. OK. Um, so... I'm from a migrant family, um, but not coming in, into Ireland, but my mum and dad left Ireland. And so um, we found ourselves in, in Britain, and I, that's where I went to college. So I went to London, I went to Goldsmiths mm -hmm. in London, did my BA there, um, which I didn't necessarily think I would, but the minute I went there on a kind of a speculative trip, I thought, I want to be here. So I really went for it. Um, 
And then after that, I worked freelance. It, it didn't occur to me to do anything other than that. I just really wanted to continue making artwork. So I didn't know any other way to do it other than to work freelance. And I was making quite small pieces and selling them through shops and galleries and then quite large pieces as public art. Um, in some cases, percent for art or mainly other public art for big institutional buildings. Um, and that was, that was grand. And I was working in different parts of Britain. But, but it was actually um, working with some international organisations that work in spectacle. So they bridge spectacle, festival and community. And I volunteered initially and then did a bit of work with them and was just blown away. I thought, OK, this is a whole different way of working. So I took baby steps in my public art work to find a way that the constituents in the spaces that I was making work for had some input, to be honest. It, it, it didn't sit totally comfortably with me and still doesn't that work appeared in a whether it be a library or a chapel or a museum you know various settings and that the people that were then going to live with the work didn't have any input so I found ways to involve people in really different ways and I suppose that was the, the beginning of my kind of social arts practice of my way of involving people um, and given their due the, the kind of commissioners were open to it no, it even, like I even hired a boss at one stage, a kind of a boss that was, that was all the seats were cleared out and a driver and toured a piece of work. So there were very big pieces of work in a three-storey atrium space and toured them around the community before the work was then installed. What year or what time oh, frame? It's <laughs> it's ages what ago. decade? <laughs> it was ages ago. Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to look it up. It's quite a while. It's before I came back to Ireland. Yeah. Um, and I've been here now, what, 20, just under 25 years. Wow. So it's a good way back. Yeah. Um, so I suppose it was a very informal way into saying, I really want to involve people, but specifically into making work. So um, I kind of knew the community arts trajectory. I'd done a lot of work in that sphere, but I actually really wanted to continue making outputs mm -hmm. and quite big scale outputs so that was my middle ground I suppose in terms of the public art sphere um, and then I moved back and um, I suppose I need I felt a, like public artwork here at that time was very different um, and it was far more kind of roadside perhaps or roundabout orientated now um, other ones. okay <laughs> so I didn't really fit um, so I, I trained in community development and I trained in... Oh, that was exciting, you all right? Yeah. <laughs> that was, uh, all eyes are on you now. Are you, are you OK? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so I trained at UCC in community development and in, and in group facilitation separately to find a way to think about if I want to work with others, what might encourage them to work with me? Mm -hmm. So to kind of see it as a bit more um, horizontal than, hey, I'm an artist, come and work with me. I, I didn't think that was a great invitation necessarily. I didn't feel um, if I wanted to work with the people I wanted to work with, I needed to find out a bit more about what might in interest them in terms of the process. Mm -hmm. um, does that give you a bit of a yeah, sense of things? Yeah, definitely. That's really interesting, actually. Um, I hadn't realised the public art or the percent for art aspect yeah. which of course has radically changed yeah. uh, since that time yeah. but just the idea of sight um, and the, uh, the idea that what we're seeing here today a lot of the material wasn't actually intended you know specifically for a gallery context yeah. in many cases you're working in uh, the public arena or kind of unorthodox spaces off-site locations um, yeah. you you tend to call them spaces in flux yeah. Um, so I suppose it's worth thinking about how do you feel like your artworks or your art objects perform differently when presented in a gallery? Is it, you know, for example, I mean, maybe we should ground it in specific artworks. The pieces here, which are obviously yeah. the remnants of performances, they're props, they're things that people have worn, and now they're art objects in the context of the gallery. So, um, do you have any sense of, of how that process, ha that transition happens? Yeah, I think, I think the, the filmic works that I make, they perform at their best in gallery settings. And I think, and we can talk about that later as to why I think that, so mm -hmm. I, and why I would really love to put filmic pieces in kind of very pared back gallery space. Um, 
I think pieces like this, so this is an in-progress work, as, as you were alluding to, mm. um, and I suppose also this, the, the, the um, day crossing farm piece, is, is like, I feel troubled at putting an element of a work into a gallery context. And that's the reason why we're doing it, <laughs> in as much as, you know, to, to explore that sense of, you know, if you look at, you know, the artifact of the, like the raven's head, yeah. or, you look, or you look at the grey house light, you then have to, in theory, perceive that as a, a beautiful artifact in its own right and its own entity in the gallery, and it gets a whole load of status. It's different with the sticks at the back because they do hold that space. Mm -hmm. They are beautiful, sacred objects in their own right, whereas these are elements of a much broader, bigger thing. It's the very nature of that, I suppose, is troubling, and that's why that something like this and this are presented in such a... Um, I suppose taking grandeur and taking space almost like a kind of a museum artifact way mm -hmm. to counter that a bit from my perspective. I mean, well, you had ideas, I suppose, in terms of why you wanted to present these um, in terms of work in progress and, and the playfulness of this um, that might be different to mine as well, which was, was looking to challenge that notion of their finished pieces and they have right in the gallery. But what was your thinking? Well, initially... Um I was interested in also, um, so I, from my practice as a curator, I have always worked a lot with artists who work within community contexts and also artists who have um, a practice that engages with societal themes, politics and gender. And, um, but I always, I've also, I have always also worked within museum contexts, so having to operate within a gallery setting. Um, and one of the questions was, since the beginning, for me, when we start discussing the possibility of doing an exhibition, uh, was how to translate the practice that, in your case, um, exists a lot in the public space, like Joanne was talking about, mm -hmm. and how to translate that into a gallery context. So here, we try to do that through different means. Uh, we offered an opportunity for a new artwork to exist within the space, so taking one of the galleries or one of the rooms in this building, which is, which is a building which already has its specific characteristics, being an heritage site and a building which was commissioned and designed to accommodate the yacht club, not an art gallery. So that is your space in flux that you appropriate and you develop a new work that exists for it and then may exist after, but was designed originally for that. But then the question was how to then revisit other works which have been presented elsewhere. And I have, for instance, Day Crossing Farm, which is here represented in this room by this shelf of, with artifacts that Marie mentioned are uh, objects that were raided by Gardai from grow houses in Ireland. Um, so I came across this work a year ago mm. in the summer of uh, 2021 when, when it was originally presented in Cork City. So the challenge was, how do you translate the practice that mostly exists outside of the gallery context? It doesn't exist also in studio, because museums traditionally bring studio work from studios to the gallery, present to the gallery, where they interface with the, with the public, and then mostly, hopefully, they then go into storage of that same museum, uh, becoming part of a collection, and then they may be represented at a later stage. So how to then tr translate that here? How to uh, present a practice that doesn't exist within this model um, and you know it could even go on and on about how the actual gallery space has its own ideology which is mimicked on the uh, ideology of the studio and so on and interestingly in this building we have a mural by an artist an Irish artist called Brian O'Durty who wrote a lot about this kind of stuff in the 1970s so the challenge was that so how to represent a practice that was not is not geared necessarily to the gallery, and um, that's when we realized we could uh, start looking at artifacts that are either remnants or reinventions mm -hmm. of that same artwork, conveying some sort of meaning through their material existence or their history. So it's material existence of this kind of object is one, but when we know where they come from and what role they played in society, and then how they were repurposed by Marie in, a, in the original artwork, and then how they have been repurposed again into here, then they start to have some sort of meaning. 
and translate the themes of the work that Marie was trying to develop. Concurrently, we're looking, okay, and how do we then translate a practice that is always in, uh, in, in development? That's when we arrive to an artwork which has not yet, yet been finished. So Dragon's Tale, the work represented behind us, it's here represented by the real pieces which were used as props in the performance uh, that was filmed um, and that then will become an artwork on its own. So it was, and this, and, and then we have a photograph there which kind of represents uh, that formative moment, but also the characters and the themes that Marie is trying to uh, engage with within that work. So the question was how to bring all these elements in a way that is still coherent as a display. So, but on the other hand, points towards the works and their narratives and histories and existence, and then to the process of making them. And then from a curatorial or museum viewpoint, um, how, do we, how does this help us think about translating practices that are not study-based into gallery context? In a way that on one hand is not, um, uh, is, not um, is, is still honoring the, rel the, the, the work when it was made in public, but still needs to be, uh, and its criticality is still there, but, but how do we then represent it in this, in this specific uh, mm -hmm. context? I'm not sure if I replied to what you were asking, but <laughs> I... No, I, I mean, as a, as a kind of separate but related issue, um, not just in relation to that which is partially um, hidden or sometimes invisible in terms of socially engaged practice that happens behind the scenes and then occasionally we have these artifacts. Um, aside from those decisions, there's also the, the model of the survey exhibition, not quite a retrospective yet, but a survey of a durational practice, which um, maybe, so I guess, what does it mean to bring together fragments of a durational practice for you. I mean, you're looking back, you're looking retrospectively, but you're also uh, presenting works that are incomplete, that are working, they're in progress, they're speculative. Um, so from your point of view, how do you feel about the selection and how that uh, reflects um, your choices? I, I think you put your finger on it there in terms of looking back, but also looking forward. That was really important for me, I think Miguel as well. And the sense of the unknown, and I think something that's really, really important in my practice now is that when I embark on a work, I, I don't know what the work's going to be. So I suppose that's an element of putting in, a, as you call it, a speculative work at this stage, bedded in the middle of an exhibition seems really important. Um, I suppose um, we've only just opened this room today, so it's early still for me, but uh, I think for me it's an opportunity then to think so it's quite a long body of time, it's about 14 years, the span of the work with the films as well. So it's to think what, what's the unifying factor that's running through and what peaks and troughs. So it's a chance for me to really think, what was I doing 14 years ago and does it relate to what I'm doing now? We're in really different times, I'm a really different person mm -hmm. and is there a common theme that runs through? So that's, that's been really important and, and I think you know, I'd, I'd like to work with Miguel on that more to unpack that more. So, and I suppose that it's to give me a chance to, to claim things that are in the practice but that lie low as well. So, so I know um, I'd have toured a couple of works and people would kind of speak quite a bit about some of the thematics of their work with, which would be like people's lived trauma. So that's something that can be quite high in the practice and then embedded in that there's elements of control. So I suppose, you know, if you think about... Um, well, we could get into examples of work in a minute, but, but there's often, you know, if you think of some of the film works, like The Two Roads, there's, there's a lot about control in that, in terms of, you know, how we as people are controlled. So that's a piece about um, if your child dies, where you have the right to bury your child. Um, so, and I suppose it's an opportunity for me to think about that in relation to trauma and control, and then also, I suppose, a sense of conflict. And I don't talk very directly about conflict in my work, but it's in all my work. It is present in terms of whether it's an inner conflict or whether it's um, a means of contro being controlled or controlling. So whether it's societally or governmentally, whether it's globally or in your own mind. So I don't very often talk about that, but it runs all the way through from the very early 
illness in them, the, the, um, the, the early species. So I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for me to work with that, to see it as a project in itself, and to think mm -hmm. where now then. So if I, if I, I would never have made that work, I'm going like that, but you know, the, <laughs> the um, Dragon's Tail work, there's no chance I'd have made that 14 years ago, mm. but the thematics are actually, the conceptual thrusts are, are very similar. They're, they're, they're still very poignant for me, mm. but I want to talk about them in different ways now. Um, so I suppose I see it as opportunity. Are you putting your hand up? Yeah. <laughs> no, also, also um, going back to what you were just saying, and based on your second, this question, um, it's a question, so for me, it's more important, so I say the process, is as relevant as, say, the artwork as a finished product. Let's just use this terminology. So here, this room is this room is about the process. It's not about the art. It's about the process that enables the creative mind to evolve. And that's why it's also relevant to have a work that is not yet, it doesn't exist as art. It still exists, but it exists as art in the mind of the artist, but it does not exist as art as an object. Um, and, and this is as much as looking back into this practice duration, all that you just, as you just said, and the process that enables it to exist, as, uh, it, it is as much as that, as about also how it will evolve. And then we also are here trying to trouble to, to kind of create a tension between the status of, of the different things that are on display. So I'll give an example, and Marie already alluded to it. The willow, the head pieces here, the willow, the willow pieces, they have a craft dimension that's really important. And they also are, they were also made by someone else. So within Marie's practice, the collaborative aspect and dimension is really fundamental. So we are involving, we are involving others here through the presence of the stuff they have made. And the status of that object, which is authored by someone and it's, this person is credited in the label, is different from the status of these objects which just were found uh, in storage uh, at, at the Garda station or something like that. On the other hand, for instance, the photograph that you see here in this room belonging to an artwork called Day of the Straws, that photograph became an artwork on its own. It has a title um, and it was actually initiated by Marie when I asked her a promotional image for that same artwork called Day of the Straws, which was not yet completed, but was going to be launched, and we needed to promote it. So I challenged Marie to create this image that would represent the Day of the Straws concept. And then it became an, art, an image that was used for promotion, but then it became an artwork on its own, and now it's here being presented alongside other artwork that is key in that artwork, which, which are the sticks, uh, made by uh, members of, Celtic, uh, of the Celtic stick makers, Court Branch, and that is uh, then a uh, kind of framing documentation of the work itself uh, through the video. And so all the room plays around this idea of process, duration, and how do you represent that in different ways? Look, well, I was open to the room changing over time. And is it going to change over yeah, time? I think yeah, think it will. Yeah. Uh, not massively, but it will change. Yes, involved. but for yeah. instance, we had also considered uh, including, say, references to an artwork called Amulet, which was presented here before in series. I'm just about to ask that, because yeah. it's a similar time frame. You mentioned the oldest work here is 14 years ago, and I think it was around that time or slightly before when you actually maybe some of the locals here might remember that um, you've previously shown in this gallery. Was it 2008 or something? Around That's that time? <laughs> she, Marie showed twice, actually. So yeah. Amulet is in the mid-2000s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, the, in the five years ago, six years ago, more or less. And then in the late 2000s, in the early 2010s, yeah. also showed twice. So there's so, two different things. I mean, I myself think, and Miguel yeah. spoke about this and just the idea of an artist maintaining kind of exactly. durational connection with the galleries and also I mean I have a kind of superstitious thing of um, artworks haunting galleries as well I mean if you think about the O'Doherty murals which are behind the walls yeah um, and uh, I mean do you want to speak about that that uh, previous work the one yeah. with the Hawthorne I could the, yeah, yeah for posterity and nostalgia <laughs> yeah um, it was in the centre gallery where the new commissioned work is right and um, I really wanted to bring a live Hawthorne into the gallery very respectfully and with great trepidation. 
on, and I did a lot of research. So because, because the Hawthorne would, in, in my thinking and, and a lot of people's cultural thinking, be a sacred tree and be venerated and people would, would also be very fearful of offending the tree. Um, some people would, would refer to it as a fairy tree. Yeah. I'd be very careful in, in terms of my description of that, but I'm saying that so people can kind of understand exactly what I'm referring to. Um, so this idea of potentially taking uh, a hawthorn tree that, that may or may not be a sacred tree and carefully putting it in the back of a van and bringing it into a gallery and trying to keep it alive, I felt was, was a really scary thing to do. Um, and I didn't do it lightly and it took a lot of time to find the right tree and then to, to navigate bringing it into the gallery and keeping it alive. Um, and then it did exactly what I was hoping it would do in as much as people were saying, so I, and I don't remember the name of the resident who was here at the time, and we never met, we did everything by email and phone, but there was a resident who was living in the basement of Sirius underneath the tree, who was messaging me saying, I'm terrified of the tree above me and are you taking care of it? And I was able to say, I'm doing absolutely everything, yeah. and so are the staff here, and it's the purpose of the tree being rehomed, but trying to do it as a, as a ven, you know, venerating it. Um, and reenacting a new ritual around looking after the tree to encourage people to discuss is this part of our cultural heritage is this important is you know what value do we place on this or is it folklore and of the past and not to be um live and, and active now um, so it was a really scary thing to do um and it people i think got it understood what what was what was being reached for mm -hmm. um I, I presented um, a series of photographs of shrines that I'd made with other trees that would be sacred trees on the land that I'd created and taken photographs. I'd never in a million years moved then, but this was um, a hedge line tree that I took the courage to move. Um, so I think people found a way into the thinking conceptually through some of the photographs. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's really interesting to now do a a commission all these years later that looks at ideas of pilgrimage and encircling and sacred sites. Yeah. Um, um, the was. Joanne, on, on the other hand, it's also important from an institutional viewpoint. Yeah. And so I, I, my, I, I see curation as, a, as an act of companionship. Right? So uh, we have been talking about this for two years and we will continue speaking about it in the next two. And um, there are other artists present in this room with whom I've been also having dialogues for two or three years, and they will be also be featured in this uh, gallery at some point, and they have also been featured elsewhere and connected to series. So it was really interesting when we were navigating the COVID period and thinking, okay, what's happened, what's happening, how to program, how to think about this space. It was really interesting to then realize that series beyond myself and my colleagues at, at this moment already had an history, a relationship with, say, Marie. And this is a moment of that relationship. And maybe in 10 years there will be another moment, or maybe in five, or maybe next year. It doesn't really matter. We don't need to follow any traditional models of programming that exist in the arts, where we do something now with you and we never speak again. That's not how we work. That's not the point. And we will work with maybe only five people in, in 10 years. And that's fine, because it's... A, it's a connection that we develop. It's not just a job. And this room where we are is also about that. It's about the connections that Marie has developed with all the collaborators, all the communities of interest um, that she has been working for many, many years and that we are trying here to kind of like just encapsulate in ways that we thought were relevant and also within our means. <laughs> Interlude. With music. <laughs> okay. no, it's nice. It um, makes us all relaxed. No, I mean, I think, I think what we should do really is we, we need to speak about the new commission. Um, I might have maybe one, one question after that, and then maybe we could open it up to the audience and just see, does anyone have any questions for um, Marie or Miguel? Um, so the new commission, um, it's a new installation. It was commissioned by Sirius. It has the most gorgeous and seductive title, Ritual of Stone and Water, Pilgrimage to the Ninth Wave Multiverse. So um, I guess I'm interested in the tension between the research and the objects. And so I wanted to ask you, um, I guess about your material concerns, but also the ways in which 
your research is kind of responding to also the architecture of the building and the site of, of Sirius beside the water. So um, maybe, maybe just that, your materials and your, your um, the architectural site and how that informs the new commission. Um, okay, so I think when, thank you for inviting me to for the commission, Miguel, that was great. Um, and I suppose I didn't know originally, initially, what it, what form it would take. And I suppose that's the case with all my work. I didn't, didn't necessarily know. And the invitation was very generous in terms of it, it, it was to create a work. Um, and I think because it was in lockdown and I'd just done a, a, a substantial work that was all online, that's yeah. the day of the straws work. Yeah. I think I intuitively felt this has to be a physical work. Yeah. I want to be able to walk around it, smell it, feel it, touch it, hear it, have it really affect me and for it to go back to something that's very visceral. Um, and I suppose in terms of the thinking conceptually, um, I'd always do a lot of reading. I'd always kind of approach things through thinking about other people's writings, usually first in terms of broad research. And I, and I very much, I suppose we were talking, weren't we, about how things that had come from the Day of the Straws, which were looking at this idea of, in COVID, as an individual, how do you hope and how do you cope? Um, and there's loads of things that came out of that work. And this was one piece that we felt, I'd like to explore some elements in terms of this how do you find strength in times of potential adversity? And we didn't necessarily use that language, but that's what, what the work became. Mm -hmm. um, and I was looking at, like I think everyone, I think everyone was then in our five kilometre lockdown, <laughs> looking at the natural world in a different way. So this idea of being able to liberate yourself from your home out on the road. So are you then walking the tarmac and looking at concrete or are you out on the wild mountains and what's the difference and what's the significance of the natural world compared to the built environment and I think we were all just living that we really were and whether we had a little park to go to and could we gain any sustenance and strength from a little bit of the natural world in the park so that was the stuff that was in my mind in terms of the impact the natural world is having on us all and so I wanted to make a work that was about that and that had materiality at its core um, and then to anchor it. And of course, this, this site was that. Yeah. It's both a site of refuge, so it works as a place of isolation, but it's also a site of encountering with nature. Yeah. So that convergence of the reality of the institution, the fabric of the building, and the research and interests that Marie was developing, and kind of the experience that we were all having was converging around, okay, something that Marie is now describing, and then we can continue. Yeah, yeah. so as I'd call it, a place of flux, potentially, because it's on the shoreline. Um, and so, to anchor it a bit, because that's very big, so to anchor it, I attended a course, I, I did something which is really lovely to do, so I attended a 10-week evening course, led by Jenny Butler, Dr. Jenny Butler, who's contributed texts here, mm. who's, a, who's a real... Um, She's a very immensely well-regarded scholar in terms of, um, I suppose, broadly myth and magic and folklore. So I um, absorbed a lot of information through Jenny as a, as a student. Um, and that gave me threads then back out into the community. And I spoke to people who are right now in our time and presence grappling with some of the things that Jenny speaks about from a scholar scholarly perspective mm -hmm. over, over millennia almost, you know. Um, so, um, so, Willie, you were someone that I spoke to in terms of, you know, your specialist skill and knowledge and um, openness to share with me in terms of your hand. Mm -hmm. I call it hand analysis, you call it hand reading, don't you, skills or chiromancy. So, and I suppose, you know, Willie would be one person that I'd then reach out and say, can you share with me some, some of your specialist knowledge and your thinking? Um, and then there was a Holy Well expert that I very much wanted to um, learn from. So Amanda Clark, who has phenomenal experience in terms of going out, finding wells, because you don't just wander out and find them. Um, and then the ritual and folklore around wells. Um, and the Cove Supernatural investigators here in Cove to kind of reach out to them through You're, you're going to have an actual supernatural <laughs> yeah. investigation event 
sometime in the next few weeks. Yeah, that right? yeah, wow. which is amazing, I suppose, in the sense of um, enacting the live tradition of seeking a, com a commune in some form, mm -hmm. and without, in my understanding, my limited understanding, without inv invoking it, but to see is their presence. Um, so I suppose, and there's many more. And I think Helen Barrett, who's here, you know, in, informed huge amounts of thinking in terms of people's presence in a in a in a country and a, and a world that has potential to um, be strengthened and um, I suppose steered up, geared up um, through things that we don't necessarily understand. You know, in terms of other, what I would, in my lay person's terms, through another worldly presence. Mm -hmm. So um, this was all moving around. Um, I suppose in terms of conceptually through attending the course, then having conversations with individuals that are out there in the world doing this for themselves, um, not, not necessarily identifying as artists, but doing amazing work. Um, and then I was thinking, I just really got excited about this idea of a silo. I was trying to find a, a piece of architecture that could challenge the architecture of this building, because this building is beautiful. But boy, you have to take control of it, or it will take control of you. Yeah. You know, you really have to honour it, but you have to um, manage to bring in something that can take its own ground. And I didn't, I didn't. Um, it had to be of the outdoors. So, after a, a, a lot of toing and froing and ideas, I, I really settled on this idea of. A, I knew it had to be an agricultural building, yeah. and I, I love the idea of a grain silo and this idea of which is what it is next door. Yeah. <laughs> I used to get watch talking about grade silos. <laughs> this idea of a container of precious material and that you could enter into. Um, and so we spent time, didn't we, finding um, an engineering company that could work with us to create a silo. And we could talk about that in a minute. And, and, and I think Miguel here was interested in this idea of the housing the soundscape that's fundamental, and I knew I wanted to create a soundscape 100% early on. I knew there needed to be an immersive soundscape. So I think Miguel and myself knew that they were core components, but I was pushing out, wasn't I? I was saying, it's not enough to just have that container. I, I want to take the ground of the room. That's so important to me. Um, and I suppose that's in terms of the layers of symbolism are really, really important to me. And, and you, had to, <laughs> you had to negotiate loads of stuff in terms of the weight of the quartz, you know, in terms of when you're bringing in, like, you know, over a ton of quartz yeah. into the floor, <laughs> um, and then the charcoal, and there's some <laughs> ton bags of charcoal. So there's a lot of practicalities, but I didn't have to worry about that because you worried about that with Brian, the brilliant producer here. And so it gave me liberty, I suppose, to think about how do you bring in materials that have in inherent symbolism um, and rethink them through a work that then has meaning to everything that I was learning and that what people in the community are doing day to day, mm -hmm. with, which is all very hidden um, in many ways. Does that answer your question? Kind yeah, of going on a ramble then. Yeah. But, uh, yes, I'd like also to add something if possible. Um, but the first draft of the, of the, of the, of the narrative that then is now manifesting this artwork was written around, say, October, November of 2020, mm -hmm. which was uh, before the second lockdown in Ireland, but just a few months after the first lockdown. Mm -hmm. So as Marie described, a lot of the research and the ideas that she was trying to develop had to do with that experience of, of being under lockdown and walking. And, but the immediate response that Marie created around that time was this artwork called Day of the Straws, in which myself and Kath Gorman here, she's also here, worked with Marie and, and others, um, Katie Holly, um, Peter Shea, um, and other co collaborators. And, Crucial, Marie also mentioned this idea of hope and cope that somehow, and really, it was very interesting what you just said, like from something that could only be existing in the world as an artwork through the digital realm, because we were all living in, or at least in isolation, right? So encounters like this face to face could not take place. So the drive was, we need, you know, if I'm pushing this, these themes further, it needs to exist in a different way. So very strongly from a material viewpoint, it's very, grounded and it's very strong there. But originally was really important this idea of hoping and coping, this kind of duality. And and uh, Day of the Straws was also really important for me as a foreigner in Ireland to somehow deal with this alternative understanding of what the pandemic is and how the people uh, engage with it. 
beyond what, say, the HSC says or beyond the normal medical approach. So the idea of protection and using charms and everything else related to uh, a pre-Christian culture that's very present in Ireland was really important around that time and for David Strauss. So the artwork, the concept evolved between this idea of like, of what the pandemic is, how people protect against it, but you know, how do you understand the pandemic as, a, as punishment somehow? You know, we've been punished. And you know, today in 9 of April of 32, our public debate is very much dominated by the situation in Ukraine, but also recently by COVID-19 and more broadly by climate change. So the transformations of nature, we were encountering nature, but nature has been transformed in such a way that we are at the verge of extinction. Um, so it was really important that duality, open cope, cure and protection. And that's what is translated also in this artwork. Because when you enter the room, you see this structure painted in orange, which, okay, we may recognize as a vernacular piece of architecture, a grain silo, but ultimately is a structure painted in orange, which somehow symbolizes an encounter with some sort of physical presence that is bigger than us um, and kind of symbolizing this massive uh, existence to which we need to be humble to or maybe warning us towards something. When we walk around the silo and then we find the door and we go inside, that's the isolation moment, but it's also the moment of, uh, of our, inner, our personal world to emerge and the, uh, it's a moment of healing. So whatever the warnings to which we were, that we were encountering when we encountered the structure, that's the moment where we can then deal with them. And um, this really, it's, it's really this manifestation of the themes that we were also considering the last couple of years and that then evolved. And the notion of silo land in Ireland versus then the Holy Well, that's how then it materialized and, it, and the conversation evolved past the COVID-19 context into something that is much more broad and has much more to do with uh, the politics of this place. Um, and of this place meaning in Ireland and, and County Cork and the, the, the connection between us and the other world. Yeah. yeah. I'm doing some sort of art criticism here, sorry about that. <laughs> and I, uh, to, I should probably say that just because you asked there and, and I didn't, I circumnavigated around it, um, I really wanted to work with the view. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, and I, work, I worked with um, a really fantastic lighting designer, Owen Lennon, and I'd say I drove him mad because the, the light's so strong in from the ocean. Um, and I know that work would, would be very powerful if we blacked out all the light, which I know, you know would be a different work, but I really wanted to work with the idea of how the light changes over time in that gallery, how the light, if it's sunlight, can come in in shafts. Um, and, and that idea that you sit in contemplation looking out on the water, what that means, but also the fact you can see the silo from the street. So this layering of yeah, you've, got the, the you've got the everyday people going past, walking past or driving past exactly outside, and then you've got exactly the same happening on the water course there, and we're like a moment in time between the two. So it's a lot harder for the work, but I, w I wouldn't let go of that, that idea of the view. Yeah, but that's um, also, the, I guess, the pilgrimage aspect that yeah. you're alluding to, yeah. the coming in and walking around. And, yeah. and I guess the cylindrical form and its, it's resonance with Neolithic mm -hmm. yeah. Christian structures yeah. um, and the idea of coming in and entombing, but also the idea of um, light shifting at different uh, times of the year and the summer solstice and the way light enters these structures in Ireland, you know, all of that is really resonant. I mean, there's a couple of things we could continue to speak about, but I wondered if um, there were any questions coming from the audience at this stage. Yeah. If there's anything, any works that you've seen that you want to speak about or ask about or anything you think particularly liked or do you have a question? I do. I'm a visual artist myself um, with a different ability. I, I, my name is Larry Nolan and I am an, a, an Irish artist. I'm a clove artist, so here is my local place. And I work at Susha Inclusive Arts Aid Clove Foundation. This is Fiona who supports me and Mrs. John who is my mentor artist. But um, I do paintings and I make funny things out of funny creatures out of female clay and that. But the question for you, um, 
with your work, like, you know, when you did the straws there and your pictures there and your technology things, what is your favourite work that's more in your heart? My favourite work in my heart? That's a good question. Um, do you know, if I answer you honestly, it's the work that I'm... It, it changes each time and it's the work that I'm making at the time. It's the, and it's not necessarily the favourite, it's the work that gets under my skin and that I can't sleep at night because I'm thinking about and it's that one because it's not finished. So it's annoying, and it, it, but it fires you. It kind of, I'm, I'm sure if you're painting, you know what I mean. You can't let go of it. It's just there. It's unfinished business. So thank you. Thank you. So it's not, it's, it's that thing of, it's itching at you until you get it right. Yeah, it's a good question. No, I kind of came at it sideways. <laughs> Any other Ellen? questions? Yeah. Answers? Um, my question, actually, seeing as you call me out, Miguel, um, I'm interested in your your plan to work with fewer artists but over longer times. And is that determined by geography, or can you answer that question? Uh, it's. I think it's determined by methodology rather than geography. It can be someone in Japan. It doesn't matter. Um, although I don't think we'll be able to show work of a Japanese, Japanese artist here or someone based in Japan um, immediately for uh, resource reasons and others. But it's, it's more a methodology. Um, it's, uh, for instance, we stopped doing group shows here. It doesn't really matter because we don't want just to bring stuff from somewhere into another place. We don't want to be a venue in the sense that we just are a container for stuff to, that exists somewhere to, to, be trans, to be presented here for others. This is a place of production. So in order to produce, and produce means a lot of things, the word is very, uh, can mean different things or have different manifestations. It's a place of production means that you have to invest uh, intellectually and emotionally rather than just providing resources. So when you asked about, when you, brief, when you read the long title of that artwork, uh, you could also read the long title of this uh, exhibition. Mm -hmm. And of course that the title has lots of narrative within it, has a story. Each word means something, the same as the materials in the commissions. Each material means something. But the title is also part of a dialogue. So it's not that the artist said the title of the piece is this and that's it. We had maybe 15 titles or 10, or 5, and all of them represented thinking process, a, a joint thinking process, sometimes led by Marie, sometimes led by me, sometimes we did, none of us led it, it just appeared. And in order to do that, so this investment requires um, a generosity, a mutual kind of generosity where we need to be available for the others, for, for the other. And this means that you can only do this with a handful number of people, you can't do this with everyone. So it's about that, it's that kind of method. And, but mostly, and, and then, um, yeah, it's about, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, that's a, there's, there is a French expression within the leftist political tradition called compagnon de hood. So the, that one, that which walks along you. So those were like the, the people that were not affiliated with the Communist Party of France, but they were their companions. And um, that's kind of the same stuff I do, you know, like we, have to be together. And then the same thing, like this, this what just the Maria described about the engaging, engagement with the water and the light, this can only be possible. So for, in order for that experience to really be um, made available to the public, the artwork needs to be on display for around six months. And it will be on display for around six months. And uh, from an institutional viewpoint, uh, that is not necessarily normal. Um, so we need to program around those needs in order for the work to have its life and the life it requires for, to, for, it, for it to be experienced uh, broadly. So, yeah, that's kind of, I guess, what I can tell you now. Thank you. Uh, the top, uh, you know, it's what, what they call the next fun. Yeah, I'm just, just asking, you know, uh, is it uh, is it something to do with time, like this mo is, is emotion, and then the, this reflecting beneath? I, I just uh, that's really beautiful. It it 
in a very philosophical way it would be. And where the work came from, the work's about, um, the story of the work is about people that have been trafficked and that have been held captive against their will in cannabis grow houses in Ireland. And so this equipment was seized by Ongarda Shea Corner in a grow house in Ireland and then donated into a project that caught with some festival commissions. Me and I worked with a big team of people to, to make it. So what you just put your finger on is a much broader philosophical way into the work, which is brilliant. Um, but it, in terms of where, in essence, the object came from, it sat in the grow house, potentially with someone who's been trafficked and held captive. Um, and that's what that piece of work was about. But when it was seen, as Miguel said last year, um, its, it's um, way of being seen in the world was a four-storey building with 11 rooms and a taxi cab that people walked all the way through. So, you, so this was a tiny, tiny aspect of a, a much bigger work. But there's a little video on the side there that is a, is a kind of a walkthrough of this massive building that isn't replicating a grow house, but is, I suppose, reimagining some of the thematics of to do with trafficking and to do with if you're held against your will. Mm. And to do with the, the utopian vision of why people smoke cannabis. So this, this again, like you're saying, the, the kind of the binary of, I suppose, a utopic vision of whether it's relaxation, whether it's recreation, whether it's liberation, whether it's looking for euphoria in terms of, you know, out of mind body experience of taking a, 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 a mind altering drug matched with the manufacture and distribution linked to, um, I suppose, gangs. Um, exploiting people in Ireland, in Cork. Um, and so that, you know, the, the, not the judgment, but just the presentation of the two elements through work. Um, so, yeah, it is about the passing of time and all those things you beautifully said. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the thing with the work to try and hold your nerve because, because it did involve people that were trafficked that shared their story. So it's to kind of honour that. In, in the work, um, and Court with someone did an, an amazing job of supporting us all to, to you know, navigate that. Yeah, yeah. And Kath's here, so thank you, Kath. Just the last question, and this is a very good question, and I think it's very important. And just to let you know, but down the line, um, would you ever like to support people who act as with different abilities? Different abilities. It's a new word of disabilities and special needs? I think I, I wouldn't say support. I'd say work with. Because I think support's looking at, there's a hierarchy that I'm offering someone who might have, have, a, have a need. Whereas I think, for me, when I work with people, I'm looking for a reciprocity. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking that, say it was yourself, I'd, I'd be oh, thinking, it, it, support is spot on, but I'd be looking, if, say, for example, it was you, I'd be looking for you to support me and me to support you. So it goes both ways. And that's a brilliant way. Well done to you. Thank you for answering that. You're welcome. Thank you. Would, um, which you've done the data stores, um, when you're doing a project, you see you're doing an art exhibition, would then other ideas come to your mind to further the exhibition up to something else? Like, I mean, this seems a bit like a continuation, slightly from the days of Charles, as far as I can see. So, would that be also in your mind? Like, when you're doing one exhibition, you're in your mind to why the project on for something else? You would you be thinking about that? You're spot on, Willie, but not in a um, tangible way. So, it's more like a kind of, um, there's a trace. And I try really hard to make notes, but I'm not, not very disciplined at that. So I try and talk to people who are close to me and try and, I suppose, give space to the things that I know can't live in a work. Um, and very often, you, I might end up with two or three works that have a, have a trace through, because you're spot on yeah. in terms of... There was things that... I was really impacted by certain things in Day of the Straws, um, and I knew it wasn't the place to... I, you can't put everything in, in one work. It becomes a cluttered mess. It becomes like my mind, you know? Yeah. Um, so then it's to find space, but, it, it, but I couldn't necessarily articulate it clearly at the onset. That's where it's really useful working with someone like Miguel, so you can articulate some of the trace, some of the unfinished business, some of the passion, um, and then someone like Miguel could say, but is it this, and is it that, and which is it, and, and to give space then that it can evolve and change as well. Um, and I suppose that's why it's interesting, going back to your question of, you know, um, presenting work over a long period of time to see the thread through. 
Yeah, but, he, but yes, really, it's true that the, the commission we were talking about, the work in the circle mm -hmm. next door room, it's, yeah, it, 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 is, it, it evolves from the Strauss in that sense. Um, but it also evolves from the Maurice broader practice. So, I mean, here we have um, questions of law and uh, they are kind of relevant within some of the work in this room and they are very strong in the work next door. Questions of uh, this kind of clash between pre-Christian culture in Ireland and Catholicism and experiences of the other world. It's very, very clear, for instance, in the, the selection of films that we have. And then questions of justice, whether it's social justice society, or justice at the society level or at the personal level, they are also present in this room. Now, these are only elements, like Marie was saying. For instance, the, the best example is this, this shelf. It's just one, one display of, of a set of objects that were used in a larger artwork that was presented elsewhere. So the temptation we could have had here, or if we were in a, in a different kind of institution, could have been to recreate that um, same display. But we could never recreate the experience that the work provided first to the visitors or to the public. And then the experience of those who collaborated with Marie in making it. We could not, never recreate that here. So, um, and there has that, in, within the type of work I do, there is a massive tradition of debate around the, whether the ethics of recreating some, something or remaking something whether it's work that was made just for one specific moment in time or a specific location and so on. And so, yeah, we, we couldn't recreate. So that experience could not be that. So here the question is how to then manifest those artworks, which we identify as key within the current context, uh, setting, putting aside some, some of the artwork, say, Amulet that was presented here a few years ago. So it's not present physically, but it's present in spirit, because it already lived here, right? Um, so, how to do that? And that's the challenge that we uh, encountered. And then how to add new elements that have to do with the current research and current interest. So, for instance, the, 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 the scholar, the doctor um, that Marie mentioned was important around COVID time when everyone was a, on online and a lot of people did courses and some people did permaculture courses and some people did philosophy courses and some others did religion and myth and magic in Ireland courses. Um, so we then asked Jenny, the same uh, prof professor, teacher at UCC which gave that course Marie attended, to write a glossary of terms that somehow represent uh, those ideas, those themes. So we insert them here. Again, with which status? It doesn't really matter whether they are text, whether they are art, whether they are uh, just ideas. Um, we can go, if you want, we can discuss more in detail which type of text and what they do, but it's another layer of collaboration. So the room is itself a set of collaborations, and this is really important uh, for us as well. And, it, and it's probably worth saying the counter to that is it's a real challenge. If you make big works, like the work on this table here, that, that takes an Arctic to move it. And it's been presented once. It got to the European Parliament. It got locked in with COVID. It was meant to tour the whole of Europe. It never made it. And then talking with Miguel, and I'm yearning to show that work. It's like it's a, you mourn the work because it never got seen properly. You know? So how then the counter of that, of, with you know, documentary films were made that are, that are very good to give a sense of it, but you're more than not being able to show it. Mm -hmm. And do you accept, like, this is a middle ground, this is an experiment in terms of the other big ambitious work. So I don't know, you know, how one copes with that. Does, do you accept that work might only ever get seen once and that's yeah, enough? Yeah, but that, that's also, sorry. <laughs> but that's also the logistics of uh, the Irish art sector, I would say. Uh, it is a small, a small infrastructure um, in scale and in resources, and a lot of things are made. Thank you so much. And um, so a lot of things are made for a one-off presentation. And okay, say so this piece in particular we're referring to uh, was commissioned and presented in Brussels, but 
could have been presented or commissioned in Ireland first in terms of its kind of conditions of production. And um, it's the same way that we could talk about the new work that we are presenting here. So what is the afterlife of that? <laughs> of course, that's the experience of having a, a seat within a, a structure that looks at through the window to the water. And that it's not necessarily going to be replicated elsewhere. But the structure itself and the display around it with all those materials can be replicated elsewhere. But is that a possibility? Uh, what? Probably not, and I have to say that. So it has to do with the conditions in which you operate here. There is not enough infrastructure to, come up to enable these works to evolve and uh, be represented and so on. The, the typical end life of this work would be a museum collection. Well, in Ireland, there's only two museums who collect. So very difficultly, I would say, one of them will actually be able to acquire it and present it for the future generations because there's a lot of questions around it as well. So in a place where you have 20 museums, then most likely one of them would be interested in that and so forth. So, yeah. Honestly, I think we could begin to wrap up unless anyone has any burning questions and unless there's anything, Marie, that you feel like we haven't covered and that you would like to cover. Um, I mean, maybe informally we could just um, move around the space. I know we, were, we did talk about maybe doing an exhibition tour, but it doesn't have to even be that formal. If people want to go back and just re revisit some of the works and have a chance to speak to Marie directly, we could do that. Yes, okay. maybe before we do that, I could just point towards some of the things that we're going to do after. Oh, yeah, good idea. Um, before, so, uh, yes. before we do that, I just want to say one thing. Yeah, go ahead, please. No, sorry. Just because you'll, you'll do a summary wrap, yeah, won't yeah. you? Um, if you get a chance, I think it would be really lovely to sit quietly. It might be hard because there's quite a few of you, but to listen to um, Clean and Elise and um, Maya Sophia's soundscape that's in the silo, because um, it was really fantastic working with them, and it, and it comes from four sides. And you might, if you don't get a chance today, you might come back, because it's a really beautiful, evocative piece, I think. So just to, just to say that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because we didn't get a chance to talk about the sound. Yeah. Okay, Nicole. No, no, I mean, this is exactly the, the, the interesting... Um, what is interesting in Marie's practice is all these different uh, creative and community contributions. Um, and particularly the community contributions, the level of people involved from academics to, to uh, specialists in, um, in unknowledges, you know? not in knowledge, but unknowledges. But the true knowledge are those unknowledge, so the knowledge that we, we have, we acquire by ex through experience. Um, and here we have all of that, and in particular in the new work, there's several con creative contributions. Um, but yes, yeah, so we, we are, after the selection of films that we are presenting, then we're going to present a new, a, a new, a, another film called Yes, But You Care, which, um, which is also going to be presented at the Irish Museum of, of Modern Art. Ellen is here. Um, this will be in July, and the work has been acquired for the connection of collection through, through IMA. So we will be somehow then presenting that work. That's a really, this, this is also a recent piece that Marie did just last year. Um, and actually we'll ask a question that we talked about before about that. But, and then we will, so that will, this presentation will be in early, early August. And then, um, and then there is a series of events we're going to do across the summer. So it continues next week with the paranormal investigation of this particular building mm -hmm. that will be next Saturday, uh, Easter Saturday at 9 p from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. If any of you is interested wow. in that, you could come <laughs> and speak to me directly because we'll have just a limited group of people. And, and, then, and it's an auspicious date and the tide is at an auspicious level. So I suppose to, to give reason why it's on it, Christmas, it, well, it, rather understand. Easter. Exactly, yeah. so the date is not random. The date and the time are specific, has to do with the tide, with the moon, everything. Everything is, may, may not sound, but everything is thought in that way. And in a, in a parallel uh, uh, event, we will have on early June a uh, holy well visit, uh, led by Amanda Clark, who is this uh, person who has been uh, working with this, um, with this with holy wells in Ireland. So it again will be a limited number of people, so we, we, will, we will basically do a, pil a pilgrimage together to this, holy, to this site and uh, 
I didn't know much about holy wells in Ireland, so I had to research them. Okay. And you might have got a little vial, or you, you might not, but make sure you take a little vial that, was, holy water. that is holy water from a different well. It's from a holy well in Callum. So please take a little vial home with you. Exactly. It's to be on the table. So sorry, George. Uh, but and that's then, important. Yeah, yeah. And then we will time. have Jenny Butler speaking to what uh, we, Marie and myself, in uh, uh, so 20, uh, around 23rd of May, so the week after Easter. Then we have a little break, and then we'll have Willie and a friend of Willie also speaking in public about their experience uh, with the paranormal and other uh, relevant uh, knowledge they have. Then we will have exhibition tours. I will be in conversation with Marie as well. And there is other opportunities also to, we are still going to program more. Maybe we'll have Ellen, who's also here today, speaking in public. Ellen is a very important figure here in Cove. So it's a process, it's a program that is also evolving. And uh, we will probably incorporate a few more things into this room. Uh, we, I believe that exhibition launches, openings, or whatever moment, or whatever word you want to call it, it's actually the beginning of the journey, not the end of the journey. We tend to kind of wrap it up. For me, it's the opposite. That's, this is now where we start. And if we don't feel it's, if we feel it still needs something, we will add something. And if we feel that there's something that doesn't work, we will change it and so forth. So, um, yes. Yes. That's a good question. Could be any of could, could be any of that. Uh, although, yes. Uh, although the, the the in order to be the public also to be contributing to that. We, there would be forms for that kind of dialogue to exist. But yes, it's, it's potentially any of, any of that. Um, I'm not saying that's going to happen necessarily, but that's, that's, that openness exists. And um, it's very process-based. You know, everything you see here also, it, it has came, it came to existence through a very organic process. It's, it's thoughtful, but it's also very organic. And there are things that we weren't sure until we actually saw them. Let's say the position of this table here yesterday was changed from what we had imagined originally. Uh, the insertion of the texts were only finalized. Which texts we were going to have first on display? Just made that decision yesterday as well. So a lot of this, and then there are lots of discussions. This is more disclosures around curating and artists working. There's lots of discussions that somehow are semi relevant but are really important. Like we have a huge email exchange about the frame of that photograph. And yeah, people look at just the frame, right? We spend a huge amount of time debating the frame. And in some cases, uh, Marie kind of agreed with what we were proposing. In some cases, we also, uh, Marie took the lead at, and so on. So it's really an interesting process as well, way of working, which it's rich for all of us. And, um, and the fact that we have, say, Joanne and others also coming and interacting with us and with the exhibition, it's really important for us in terms of, you know, the level of criticality that we want to, to develop around the practice because this is also something that was really important to me. Uh, someone like Marie or others in this room like Fiona or Colette, artists or Mel and Andy who are in residence this week or anyone else, um, Sarah is also there as well. Um, for me, it's really fundamental that we generate opportunities for this course around the practice to exists to take place. Whether it's led by us or it's mine, it doesn't matter, I actually prefer not to. But our role is also to facilitate that. So Joanne is going to write a piece for us and we will see what happens with that. Maybe we want to do a publication, but we may not be able to do it. So, but the piece exists. And so Joanne had to engage with us to do it and we had to engage with her anyhow. So as soon as it exists, then there will be a moment of presentation. And today in the world of technology, that's if nothing else, we can just put it online. So this is really, it's process. And um, it's also possible only with artists like Marie, we are, we, are, we are open to this conversation. And I remember in one of your uh, bursary, Arts Council bursary applications, probably the last one you received, there was a lot of talk about this dialogue and what does it mean to have this relationship. So. It's really interesting that as well. Yeah. Well, I suppose I could wrap up by uh, congratulating Sirius and yourself, Miguel, and all your staff 
and obviously Marie on a fantastic show and hopefully this is the start of or maybe even a midpoint <laughs> in a long and fruitful relationship that will continue with Sirius and thanks to all of you um, for being here today to attend in on this beautiful day in this fantastic site um, on the occasion of a really magical show so thank you very much thank you